So now we've got to talk about some exceptions to Zaitsev's rule, and there's really four main ones, but two that are definitely more important than the other two. Uh, and the first one is one of the more important ones, and that's involving a bulky base uh, along with a bulky substrate, typically a bulky alkyl halide. So if you notice in this example, I've got a tertiary halide. So, and it turns out this guy right here is what we call a bulky base. This is potassium t-butoxide or potassium terp-butoxide, and he is by far the most common bulky base you're probably likely to encounter. So, and if you take a look here, so we've got our alpha carbon right here being tertiary. And being uh, tertiary, you've got three adjacent beta carbons here. So one there, one there, one there. These are both secondary. This one's only primary. And so Mr. Zaitz, I would say, use one of the secondaries. And it turns out they're both equivalent. So if we use a normal non-bulky base like sodium methoxide here, you'll find that your Zaitsev product using one of those secondary beta carbons uh, is the major product and your Hoffman using that primary beta carbon on the outskirts of the molecule there uh, is the minor product. But if you use your bulky base, in this case, due to his bulkiness here, he's going to prefer using the least substituted beta carbon, the primary one in this case, and that's why your major product forms the least substituted alkene, so whereas your minor product is now the Zaitsev. So here your Hoffman ends up being the major product with a bulky base. So in the, the key here is it's bulky base and a bulky alkyl halide. So the truth is that it's tertiary halides specifically that are going to always form the Hoffman product as the major product. It turns out it's a kinetic product rather than a thermodynamic product just due to sterics here. Uh, but it turns out with a secondary halide, it's not quite so straightforward. Uh, some of the bulkier secondary halides will still form the Hoffman as the major. Some of the less hindered ones actually might still form the Zaitsev. Um, and so oftentimes what we do here is we just oversimplify the process. Uh, and it gets oversimplified in one of two ways. And you want to find out which one your professor is oversimplifying with. Usually we'll just say that with a bulky base, you always get the Hoffman as the major and the Zaitsev as the minor. That's one way to oversimplify this. The other way would be to say with tertiary halides, you get the Hoffman as the major. And with secondary halides, you still get the Zaitsev as the major. And again, even that's still a little bit of an oversimplification. So just kind of pay close attention to which method or which oversimplification your professor is using because uh, usually it's one or the other. The first is much more likely. So a lot of times the general rule people just give is that, you know, bulky bases, Hoffman's the major, Zaitsev minor, done. So again, it's really more complicated than that, but oftentimes we just kind of simplify it to that. So we've seen that with a bulky base, you often get the Hoffman product as your major product rather than the Zaitsev. Uh, so I want to show you the most common bulky bases. And we've already talked about the most common by far, and that's potassium terp-butoxide here. Uh, you might see it represented with the Lewis structure. You might see the condensed formula, or you might just see it written out in words, either potassium terp-butoxide or potassium t-butoxide. But hands down, the most common bulky base we'll ever use. Uh, the other two, though, that you might see are maybe DBU and DBN here. So, And this nitrogen right here is the basic one, and due to the big uh, bulkiness of the rings, a lot of sterics involved in these uh, also tend to give you the Hoffman product as the major product uh, in E2 reactions. Uh, we've also got LDA here, and this one's a little less common for this chapter, um, but you might see this towards the end of OCHEM2 brought up again, but just cover my bases here, LDA, lithium diisopropylamide, Slight chance you might see it in this chapter, uh, but more likely not one you'll encounter till the end of OCHEM 2. So the second exception to Zaitsev's rule occurs when you have a chance of forming a conjugated pi bond. So in this one, you may or may not see. It's not the most common thing in the world, but it's totally possible, totally fair game. But uh, if you look here, we've got our alpha carbon right here. He's got the leaving group. We've got two adjacent beta carbons. This one on the right is tertiary, the one on the left is secondary, and Zaitsev would say use the tertiary one, and that would get you our alkene over here, and it would be the more substituted alkene. Well, it turns out in this case, the more substituted alkene would actually not be the more stable alkene. If we use the secondary uh, beta carbon on the left, instead, we'd get the pi bond right here, and the key is, is that it is a what we call a conjugated system, and it leads to delocalization of the pi electron. So it turns out this occurs most commonly when you have a single sigma bond in between pi electrons. It turns out these will not be separate systems of pi electrons. It's one big giant system, and there, there's delocalization of those pi electrons over the entire conjugated system. Now, if you have more than one sigma bond in between pi electrons, we say they're isolated. There's no connection. There's no delocalization associated with that, uh, no lowering of the energy at all. And so it turns out in this example, 
example, the most substituted alkene is actually not the more stable one. The conjugated one actually ends up being more stable. So if you have a chance of forming a conjugated alkene, uh, let that take priority over Zaitsev's rule. All right, so the third exception to Zaitsev's rule is if you have a poor leaving group, and specifically in this chapter, that would be fluoride. So chloride, bromide, iodide are great leaving groups, and iodide is the best. Uh, they're all very negligible bases, being the conjugate base of strong acids, but HF is a weak acid, and F- is an actual legitimate weak base. It's a much stronger base than either chloride, bromide, or iodide, and as such, it's not a great leaving group. So turns out when that's the case, uh, the mechanism, I'm going to say, is a little bit sluggish in an E2 reaction. Let's kind of see how this plays out. So I'm going to draw in one of the beta hydrogens here. So we're going to come and deprotonate, so a proton transfer reaction right here. So, and we're about to dump these electrons in to form a pi bond right here and kick off the fluorine. The problem is, is fluorine's like, uh, you want me to leave? I kind of suck at leaving. And so in his hesitation to leave here, these electrons have trouble dumping into this pi bond or else we'd violate this carbon's octet rule. And so in the transition state, there's actually a buildup of negative charge on this carbon. And it's very carbanion-like, we say, in the transition state. So carbanion stability is the exact opposite of carbocation stability. And again, that transition state being carbanion-like, I'd rather have it on the primary beta carbon than on the tertiary beta carbon. And that's what's kind of behind us getting the Hoffman product. And forming the Hoffman product, we'd have that carbanion-like structure on a primary carbon. In the Zaitsev product, we would have had it on a tertiary carbon instead. So that's kind of the deal here. Again, this is a kinetic product. It's not the thermodynamic product. It's not the more stable product. Um, but it does have the lower activation energy, so it's the kinetic product. Uh, you may or may not encounter this one. It's the least common of the four exceptions. So uh, if it doesn't look familiar, a good chance it wasn't presented in your course. All right, so here's our fourth exception to Zaitsev's rule, and it's not going to make much sense yet, but if you don't have an anti-periplanar hydrogen on your beta carbon, uh, then you can't form an alkene there. So this is going to be a little bit strange here. We'll talk about what anti-periplanar means here in a little bit, but the, the most common place this shows up is on cyclohexane. So in this case, here's our alpha carbon. So, and we've got a beta carbon right here and a beta carbon right here. And if we draw the relevant hydrogens in, so here we've got one on a wedge. So, and on the beta one here, we've got one on a wedge and one on a dash. So, and in this case, on a cyclohexane ring, what ultimately periplanar is going to need to mean is it has to, the hydrogen I take from the beta carbon has to be trans to the leaving group. So here's our leaving group. It's on a wedge. So the hydrogen we take has to be on a dash trans on your cyclohexane ring and these two wedge hydrogens will not work it turns out so there's some stereo specificity associated with the E2 that we haven't discussed yet uh, but suffice to say I just want to point out in this case this is your other exception to Zaitsev's rule in this case we would not be able to use that hydrogen at all and we would not be able to form the alkene in that location so it turns out we only get it with the other beta hydrogen this anti-periplanar uh, arrangement here is absolutely mandatory and we're to take a much deeper look at what it means to be anti-periplanar here but that's your fourth exception so uh, bulky base bulky substrate and then this anti-periplanar hydrogen these are the two most common examples of when you might violate Zaitsev's rule